Alright guys, how's it going? At their E3 Next Horizon gaming event in Los Angeles on Monday, AMD finally spilled their guts on their long, long-awaited Navi graphics architecture, unveiling the RX 5700 XT and RX 5700 graphics cards, as well as a 5700 XT Anniversary Edition at the end of the show. Yes, this taking a hammer to it look is the real reference 5700 XT. Not sure you'll see a repeat of this one. It looks pretty decent in some slides and at certain angles, but I don't think it will be a favourite with most fans. Given AMD's history with reference blur designs, you'll likely be well served avoiding this one anyway, especially looking at the board power. So let's do that. In fact, we'll take a look at all the specs of the announced cards, starting with the 5700 XT, which has 40 compute units. Up to 9.75 teraflops, that's FP32 of course, 8 gigabytes of GDDR6, and now 3 different clock speeds. I found some slides explaining these exactly, so let's take a look. Card looks kinda decent from this angle, maybe. But the highest clock, the boost clock, is opportunistic. The card will boost to this under certain circumstances, and we see that it also depends on the chip as well. So better performance per watt chips will boost higher. That's just your silicon lottery for you. The new one, Game Clock, is what AMD calls the clock target under a typical gaming load. So presumably this is where the cards will most often be running around. And base clock is a clock target under a heavy load like a power virus, so we're talking something like MSI's combustor or Furmark, basically. Now, I've never really liked this word target, as it's a good excuse for not reaching something that's been marketed, but I guess we'll see on that one at release. But getting back to these specs, and we can see that it is up to 1905MHz boost clock, 1755MHz game clock, 1605MHz base clock. That's an 8.5% difference between boost and game clock, and something that might be worth considering later on. Looking at the 5700 non-XT, it's down to 36 compute units for 7.95 teraflops, which is around a 20% difference in flops compared to the XT, and normally that would be a decent indicator of the performance level to expect from this card. Again, 8GB of GDDR6, and the clocks are up to 1725MHz boost, 1625MHz game clock and 1465MHz base. 1465 base? That's actually lower than Nvidia's Pascal cards built on TSMC's previous 16 nanometer node. The final card announced at the end was this Anniversary Edition XT, which has higher clock speeds and 10.14 teraflops. This is interesting though that they haven't pushed the boost clock to 2 gigahertz, which would have been a very nice marketing number. They've fallen 1% short of that, and that would have been a major milestone, so there has to be a reason for why they didn't get to 2 gigahertz. I really do like the look of this one, black and gold. Now, there weren't actually any TBP, that's typical board power, numbers on these slides, but there are on this one, which includes a bunch of other relevant information, including the same 256 bit memory bus that we always see on AMD's mid range. 14 gigabits per second GDDR6 allows for 448 gigabytes per second bandwidth. And that's the same on the 5700 as well. And this really should be enough bandwidth for a card in this class. And right at the bottom of each, we see the board power of 225 watts for the XT and 180 watts for the 5700. And I think it's time for a little history lesson. We'll go back to the beginning of GCN, very late 2011, and AMD launched the world's first 28 nanometers graphics card, the HD 7970. The chip was called Tahiti, and it was pretty large for early 28 nanometers, coming in at 352 square millimeters. This was, in fact, AMD's high end 28 nanometer product at launch, and it had a 384 bit memory bus. An absolutely huge memory bus, as we can see, in fact, over at Anantech. Below that, though, is the chip that we care about here, called Pitcairn. This was AMD's mid-range 7000 series GPU for the HD 7870 and HD 7850 graphics cards. You can see the memory bus again, it is way, way smaller, and this is a 256-bit memory bus. 
One interesting thing about AMD's 7 series was their pricing. Until this point, AMD had been fighting Nvidia in market share and prices were generally very, very competitive on AMD's side. And that helped to keep Nvidia's prices somewhat in check as well. I covered that before in the GPU war is over video. But with the launch of the 7 series, AMD were first to 28 nanometers and the HD 7970 was the world's fastest graphics card for around about three months. And they priced the card to reflect that. As we can see over at Anantech Review, it was priced at $550, whereas AMD's previous fastest card, the HD 6970, was priced at $350, although I think that was $370 at launch. But AMD priced the card to reflect its better performance than Nvidia's leader, the $500 GTX 580, which the 7970 was around about 25% faster than. These top two cards, the 590 and the 6990, are dual GPU cards, so I'm not including those in this. Ten weeks later, in early March, AMD then launched the 7870 GHz edition, which got very close to the 580. AMD priced this one at $350, which was the cost of the previous flagship, but still somewhat justified based on Nvidia's $500 GTX 580 price. But the point was, few people were impressed by AMD's prices, or indeed the performance of the HD 7970. And they had good reason to be unimpressed as later on in March, Nvidia retook the performance crown with their GTX 680, their mid-range GTX 680. And we knew it was mid-range because it had that same 256-bit memory bus, the mid-range codename, and a die size of 294 square millimeters. So Nvidia, for the first time in years, had beaten AMD with a smaller, more efficient GPU. People did take note of that. The Kepler 680, at only 294 square millimeters, was faster and more efficient than AMD's 352 square millimeters Tahiti. That was almost unbelievable after Nvidia's disaster with Fermi. Nvidia deserved to retake the crown because the 680 was a cut above the typical mid-range performance. Historically, the incoming mid-range cards just about matched the previous generation flagship cards. As you can see here, the HD 7870 was only 5% slower than the GTX 580 at launch. That's a mid-range new generation card, just about tying with the older generation flagship. And we also see that AMD did beat their own 6970 flagship card by 8%. But the GTX 680, that was around about 25% faster than Nvidia's 580. And while back then, that was nowhere near fast enough to be considered the true X80 class successor, it was still, for sure, an impressive piece of engineering. The problem was, of course, that Nvidia did brand it as an X80 class of GPU. And because of AMD's pricing and lack of performance, Nvidia were justified in pricing that card at $500. A $500 mid-range card which came about due to AMD pricing their mediocre 7970 too high. Now I say mediocre, however, the 7970 went on to be one of the best graphics cards ever built. It just got off to a very bad start due to the new GCN architecture. Drivers were below par and AMD hadn't pushed the specs hard enough initially, as a few months later launched 7970 GHz edition will attest. A faster and cheaper 7970 a few months later. As I said, people did get caught up in that flagship battle, and Pitcairn, that's the mid-range 7870, that one was largely ignored, but it was actually a very good chip. And we can see this over at Tech Power Up 680 Review, and looking at performance per watt, where the Pitcairn cards showed around 25% better performance per watt, compared to the 680. And we can see a whole bunch of AMD cards there winning in performance per watt. The 680 was about 30% faster than the 7870, but it needed around 60% more power to get there. So GCN was pretty efficient. It was only the 7970, and this ludicrous memory bus it had, that was inefficient with early GCN. Pitcairn was also extremely good on performance per area too. 212 square millimeters only, while well, remember the GTX 680 GK104 was 294 square millimeters. 
So Pitcairn was more efficient and also superior in performance per die size compared to Kepler. But the damage to the market was done though, and prices would never recover at the high end. And AMD, they continued to rebrand Pitcairn. First of all, as the R9270X, which was a horrible piece of branding for various reasons. And then later on, as the R9370X. Four years of Pitcairn had people pretty tired of 28 nanometers graphics cards. We really needed a true mid-range replacement. And it came, finally, with Polaris, the RX 480. Before that, though, Nvidia had got first to 16 nanometers. The first time they'd got to the new node before AMD, they launched the mid-range GTX 1080, beating their previous high-end by 25% again. And again, they priced it accordingly at $700. AMD helped with those prices, though, because they announced multiple times that they wouldn't be competing at the high-end with Polaris. Polaris was a pretty good chip, but it was nowhere near the GTX 1080's performance level, instead competing against the GTX 1060. Regarding specs, Polaris again had that 256-bit bus and the die size of 232 square millimetres, plus this 150-watt board power, which was 120 watts for the RX 470. That was around about what we'd come to expect of AMD's mid-range and it performed pretty much like what we'd have expected against the previous generation, just about matching NVIDIA's amazing GTX 980 and AMD's own 290X at way less power against the latter. The best thing about Polaris though was the price of only $240 for the 8GB card. NVIDIA did just beat it early on with their GTX 1060, which was also a little bit more efficient again, but the performance gap was small, and that helped to keep the pricing of the 1060 down to something far more reasonable, at $250 or $300 for the Founders Edition. But then we waited on Vega at the high end, while AMD, just like what they did with Pitcairn, rebranded Polaris again and again, with performance per watt worsening with each increase in clock speed. The RX 480 is almost 20% more efficient than the RX 590. Even though the 590 is on a supposedly superior node, that's what happens when you take a mid-range chip like Polaris and then squeeze it for all that it is worth. And so, after that, we waited on Navi. And finally, at AMD's E3 event, we got it. But is it any good? Well, the answer to that, I guess, depends on which metrics matter to you. Here are some of the hardware specs. It is, of course, a 7 nanometer GPU of 251 square millimeters in size. You remember that 250 square millimeters chip that AMD talked about in this 7 nanometer cost slide? I speculated that they were talking about Navi some time ago, and that would appear to have been the case. I'll talk a little bit more about this later though, but we know straight away that Navi is a mid range chip. It's a little bit larger than Polaris which was a little bit larger than Pitcairn, but it's still squarely in that 200 to 300 square millimeter range, which signifies its mid-range. And again, it's got the same 256-bit memory bus as previous mid-range cards. And looking at Navi's key technology inflections, again, we know it's 7 nanometers, which is just an improvement over any previous node in history, in fact, allowing for faster, smaller, lower power transistors. GDDR6, is cost effective. That's interesting wording. 448 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth. In marketing speak, cost effective generally means that it's not as good as an alternative, which in this case would be HBM2, but it's cheaper. PCIe 4.0 is double the interconnect bandwidth versus Gen 3. And at the end, we see that Navi is indeed a new graphics architecture called RDNA apparently designed for gaming performance and efficiency. Now, on this new architecture, the GCN instruction set remains currently. However, Navi is clearly a major microarchitecture redesign. A lot of people get confused with this for GPUs especially. I think it's because when GCN replaced AMD's older VLIW5 and VLIW4 instruction sets, and their Terascale architecture, which ended with the 6000 series cards. GCN was the replacement of both the instruction set and the microarchitecture 
and both were called GCN. So previously, you had VLIW5, VLIW4 instruction sets, and the Terascale microarchitecture, but then they changed both to GCN. GCN being the name of the instruction set, and then it was GCN 1.0, 1.1, 1.2, 1 etc. Those were the names of the microarchitectures. The GCN microarchitecture did, of course, change by a fair bit over the years. At first, it didn't have any delta color compression, and tessellation was pretty weak on the 7000 series cards. So hopefully, that clears that part up. It's an all new microarchitecture using the same GCN instruction set. If you're still confused about this, think about x86, the CPU instruction set, and how there are different implementations of that. For example, Bulldozer and Zen. It's the same x86 instruction set, more or less, but it is a completely different microarchitecture. But now, getting back to the question, is Navi any good? What metrics matter? Performance clearly should be the number one metric. And as a mid-range GPU, we should reasonably expect it to match previous generation flagships. We saw that Pitcairn just about matched Fermi at much, much less power and die size. We saw that Polaris just about matched Maxwell at similar kind of power levels and also being quite a lot smaller die size. Those are the benefits you expect from a node progression. And Navi is 7 nanometers compared to previous generation 14 nanometers, 16 nanometers, and 12 nanometer cards. If you think back to pre Polaris, when Nvidia launched Maxwell and blew AMD away on the same 28 nanometer node, had Nvidia not done that, Polaris would have destroyed the Kepler 780 Ti. Nvidia made the right decision of improving their architecture on the long lasting 28 nanometer node. Well, as we know, AMD chose to rebrand Pitcairn. So that meant that Polaris was up against much harder competition to win outright than what Pitcairn had in the Fermi 580. There was no way that Polaris could match the 980 Ti or the Maxwell Titan X, or even Fury X. Those final 28 nanometer chips were huge, around 600 square millimeter behemoths on the by then ultra cheap 28 nanometer node. That's why those cards existed. 28 nanometers was so cheap they could get away with it. So matching the 980 was just about what to be expected, if perhaps maybe slightly better for AMD's Polaris. But Nvidia just did a better job again with Pascal. And of course, Turing is yet another Maxwell type of architecture. By that I mean Nvidia created a second new architecture on the same 16 slash 12 nanometer process node, just like they did with Kepler and Maxwell on 28 nanometers. And Turing really hasn't been given enough plaudits, I feel. At the start, we got caught up in the lack of extra performance and sniping at RTX being non viable. But the chips did show yet another improvement in performance per watt, around about 15 to 20% on the same node. So that is pure architecture gain. Had Turing not existed, we should reasonably have expected Navi to reach perhaps 1080 Ti performance. That would have been really impressive though, so perhaps somewhere in between the 1080 and the 1080 Ti was more reasonable. That sounds a lot like the Turing RTX 2070, and indeed the RTX 2070 was the card that AMD were keen to pit their 5700 XT up against in their own benchmarks. And looking over these 10 iconic games AMD has chosen, 5700 XT wins by just under 6% on average. And that was helped by a couple of outliers in Battlefield 5 and Metro Exodus. Looking at the 5700 non XT, and that beats the RTX 2060 by 9.5%. So it does appear that Navi has met its main goal of beating the competing Nvidia cards. Just be wary of the boost clock, and it's opportunistic depending on the chip. And you can be fairly certain AMD's numbers weren't done on a low quality one. Remember that the XT's boost clock is 8.5% higher than the game clock, and that is enough to put the XT ahead of the 2070. And given these are AMD's own benchmarks, which we've seen them happy to fudge in the past, with for example Fury X, I would not be at all surprised if these two cards end up really, really close in performance. 
I had a look over the end notes though, and there doesn't appear to be any issue with AMD fudging the numbers this time. However, as you know, different games will perform better on Nvidia cards. You can be certain of that. But it looks like they've hit pretty good performance targets. And I was reminded of some of my speculation in the evolving master plan video, where I reckon performance coming somewhere in between the 1080 and the 1080 Ti would be around about where Navi landed. So that looks pretty accurate, but performance is only half of the story, of course. The other half of this story is power. I already talked about Pitcairn's excellent efficiency. The 7870? That basically performed around the same performance level as the GTX 580 at around half the power. It should be said that Fermi was a power hog, so that helped. But by the time Polaris came around, it struggled to match the GTX 980's efficiency. Pascal put NVIDIA further ahead, then Turing yet further. And Navi really needed to be not only 2070 performance level, but 2070 performance level at 150 watts. That was the second part of my speculation. It's a mid-range GPU. We've known that's what Navi was targeting from long ago. And mid-range GPUs are invariably around that 150 watt level. But the XT is 225 watts and the non-XT is 180 watts. And we should expect both cards to match or even exceed those values. Over at Tech Power Up again, we can see that using their power numbers at the 590, and that's a 225 watt card drawing 232 watts, though that is the fat boy. Vega 64 draws 292 watts, Vega 56 229 watts, and the 580 is 198 watts. These are close to the typical board power values given by AMD. And in the case of the 580 and 56, they are exceeding board power by a fair distance. The non-XT's 180 watt TBP further betrays the power problem. In the past, we'd see cards spec'd at 225 watts, maybe drawing 180 watts or so. But that isn't going to be the case here. Not when there's already a card spec'd at 180 watts. Worse than that though is, the relative performance of these cards, it does appear to suggest that performance is actually scaling decently with the extra flops and the extra power. The XT card should be around 20% faster while using 25% more power. So in this case, unlike with Polaris, it doesn't appear to be a case of the XT being pushed right to the ragged edge of efficiency. And while that is good in one way, it's also bad looking at it from the perspective of what is the true performance level of this chip at 150 watts. And sadly, Navi at around 150 watts, we could be looking closer to a 1660 Ti competitor or Vega 56 rather than this 2060. And I know that many of you don't really care about power draw, but at the architectural level, this is what really matters. Navi may well be scalable like advertised, but if 40 compute units are already pulling 225 watts of power, it's not going to scale very far past the old limit of 64 compute units anyway. If we add another 50% compute units, giving us 60 overall, that's going to need a 384-bit memory bus. And overall, we could be talking about another 40% board power required. You're now looking at a 300 watt plus card, which could just about beat a 2080 Ti by a very narrow margin. And some of you probably think, well, I would take that. But this is 7 nanometers versus 12 nanometers. But how can power be so bad? AMD says it's same power, 50%, greater performance versus GCN. Yep, up against Vega, 64 in fact, which is one of the least efficient cards around today. You've got to be extremely wary of marketing and AMD is getting worse every year. And of course, they will choose benchmarks, which puts Navi in the best light. Best case performance per watt against Vega 64. And it looks pretty good in area as well against that chip. But you can still show performance against Vega 56, while well, starting at 75% on the graph. And looking through the slide deck, they've made so, so many changes. It's easily the largest overhaul in years. And like Lisa Sue said at Computex, this is their architecture for the next 10 years. Against their own cards, it's been really good. 25% extra performance per clock. 
and it's been a good performance per watt uplift, especially against Vega. While they also moved from HBM2 to GDDR6, which does have an extra power cost. But like I said, overall, the performance per watt uplift, it's against some of the worst graphics cards in history. The sad reality of Navi is it hasn't really closed the gap to Nvidia, and it really had to this time. AMD cannot continue to match Nvidia by getting to the smaller process node first of all. For starters, it's only a matter of time, or more accurately, it's only a matter of Nvidia's desire. Nvidia could be in 7 nanometers already had they wanted to be. They've got more than enough money these days. Fact is, they are competitive on an older, cheaper node, so they don't need to be on 7 nanometers. And Navi proves that. And I guess that this is the best place to end this video, looking at prices. And this is where it is just so, so bad. $450 for the XT and $380 for the non-XT. What made Polaris good, even though it was still slightly behind the performance per watt of the 980? It was the very attractive $240 price. Navi is basically the same as Polaris. A chip built for the mid-range, competing in performance versus the card it should have reached in performance, the 2070. Performance per watt will likely be a bit worse again, but hopefully nothing too disastrous. But what about RTX? I'm pretty sure that's a selling point for Nvidia as well. We're starting to see it being used now, and it's really quite cool in stuff like Minecraft and Quake 2. But let's be frank, the 2070 was already a bad value card. The $600 launch price was an atrocity, and the current circa $500 price is still really bad for a mid-range card. But but 7 nanometer is expensive, justifying Navi's prices. Not that expensive it isn't. $240 Polaris was doable on a new node for AMD. Let's just take a look at that old slide from AMD again for this actually. December 2017 it was, and as I said, very likely to be talking about Navi with this 250 square millimeter die, the normalized cost per yielded square millimeter. Polaris would be 16, Navi 7, so we're looking at just under double. It's slightly over the 2 here for Polaris and it is slightly under 4 for Navi. But Polaris was slightly smaller, so let's just call it double the manufacturing cost then. Back in late 2017. Today these costs will have closed probably quite a lot. But just to show the inanity of this 7 nanometer cost argument, we'll assume every Navi GPU costs twice as much to manufacture as Polaris did. Over at the diaper wafer calculator, the square root of 251 is 15.84. That's on both sides. And let's just go with a 0.3 defect density for now. And that gives us a miserable 50% yield with this 251 square millimeter Navi die. And now over at the silicon cost calculator, 251 die size on a 300 wafer, a yield of 0.5, and let's go with a wafer price of $12,000. So 239 gross dies on the wafer, and a cost per die of $100. I mean, Christ, that is actually a lot for a silicon die. But that's also pretty close to worst viable case. And that doesn't include all of these salvage dies like for the non-XT cards, which in reality, that would bring yield up much closer to 70 or even 80%. Let's go with 70%, including all the salvage dies. And remember, we're assuming 7 nanometers is twice the cost per yielded square millimeter. So for that, you would simply half the cost of this silicon die, which means that each Navi chip costs $36 more to manufacture than Polaris did. And that is taking some pretty hefty worst case scenarios. And let's just round the whole thing up to $50 for the extra cost of GDDR6 instead of GDDR5. And yep, that is still nowhere near an extra $210 that AMD is trying to charge for Navi. This large die size theory was bullshit with Nvidia and Turing. And the 7 nanometer cost argument is bullshit with AMD. There may have been some justification for $100, but $210? And what's really sad about this is, at $300, this 5700 XT, it wouldn't have made AMD an awful lot of money, but it would have been an absolute killer card. Even without RTX, even with drawing a bit more power 
Matching the 2070 at such a competitive cost is what AMD needed to do to win back the hearts of gamers. It's how AMD won the hearts of gamers years ago with the 4870, the 4850, the 5870, the 5850. And yes, we know how that ended up. More people bought Nvidia anyway at a higher cost. But today is a different age where social media matters, viral marketing matters, and you're already in the minds of enthusiasts because of a Ryzen 3000 series looking so good. When I asked the question, is the Navi good enough? I already knew the answer was no, Navi is not good enough. Nowhere near good enough, and it's clear to me that AMD has zero intention of fighting for this kind of market share and have effectively abandoned gamers to higher prices, all for the sake of an extra few tens of millions at the end of this year. You think about that in amongst all the billions that they will get from Zen 2, both from Epic and from Ryzen 3000. These CPUs are gonna bring billions in for AMD, but rather with their weak GPUs, rather than trying to fight back for some market share, they've basically taken the easy option of once again scalping the AMD fanboys, charging high-end prices for mid-range cards, and this time they don't even have the cost of HBM2 to blame for it. I don't want to slam Navi as being an architectural disaster, even though it may well be one. They simply cannot compete with Nvidia. They're not even close, and it has been so, so many years now. 2013 is when Nvidia launched Maxwell. You know, the Radeon Technologies Group could have reverse engineered Maxwell, stuck it on 7 nanometers, and it would be thrashing Turing. But they just don't seem to have what they used to have all those years ago. And the longer this goes on, you have to say it's likely never coming back again. But at least they're trying. And we clearly see that Navi is a major architectural change. It's just not good enough. The pricing though, this scalping pricing, I just cannot support that. I think I need to do an industry overview video soon. So look out for that one. And don't forget to check out the website again. I'll catch you later guys.